It's a good life on the whole that we enjoy in the 20th century. Superlatively good for yachtsmen battling their way here in the Tasmania race. Good too for Aussies who don't aspire to own yachts. Witness Sydney's lifesavers in the annual surf carnival. And in York Minster, how good life was that day when the young Duke of Kent married Miss Catherine Worsley. On that June day, no one had time to think of 1961 as the year of the great threat. No one that is in York, but in West Berlin, where they've lived for years with peril on the doorstep, the menace heightened. By Kremlin orders, East Germany threw up a wall which today pitilessly divides the former capital, separates wives from husbands, mothers from children. This is the situation which could, if madness prevailed, explode into World War III. While tension mounted in Berlin, Russia resumed nuclear bomb testing. The tests had no military purpose. They were a crude way of scaring neutrals into believing that the safe course is to tow the Kremlin line. And if Mao Zedong could be persuaded also, so much the better. But behind all this is the possibility that nuclear testing will harm generations yet unborn. Hence, in Trafalgar Square, ban the bomb was the demand of passive resistance. They represented millions, some famous like John Osborne and the forthright dramatist Sheila Delaney, asserting that life is our right. UN Secretary Doug Hammarskjöld, working for peace in another way, was killed in the round of duty. His plane crashed in Rhodesia. That dedicated man died for mankind. With a general strike, the year began for Belgium. An illustration that peacetime has troubles enough without war adding to them. Life is our right, but no one expected to be all honey. Not in Algeria, certainly, where what they call a limited war has plagued France for seven years. Not even de Gaulle knows how to end it. Paris at one stage expected an invasion led by mutinous generals from Algeria. Fortunately, it never happened. Strife or no strife, love finds a way. Jersey proved that honeymooners don't always want to be by themselves, provided that the hotel has newlyweds only. They'd had a tiring day. Goodness, look at the time, 17 minutes to 10. King Hussein of Jordan married again. His bride, an English girl, Tony Gardner. Life is their right, too. It's never too late to marry. How Camberwell cheered Sidney Thane. He said he was 102, the bride a mere 73. Then the birth certificate proved Sidney was no more than 79. Still, mistakes happen in the best regulated romances. In recognized sports, a vintage year. Sterling Moss won the Monaco Grand Prix. At Goodwood, he won the TT for the seventh time. What a race for the Indianapolis 500 mile. 200,000 watched 33 drivers in that death-defying event. It gets more hair raising every year. Five cars came to grief in a chain reaction pilot. In the derby, sensation of another kind. Victory for a 66 to one outsider. Sidium, a freak result, blamed on the bone hard going. But everyone praised the brilliant riding of French jockey Roger Poncelet. His first win in nine derbies. A grand horse and a very proud owner. At the White City, it was goodbye to the great Gordon Pirrie, at any rate as an amateur. The match was England versus Russia. In a grandstand career finish, he brilliantly won the 5,000 meters. A wonderful athlete. In the test matches, that formidable bowler Davidson played a big part in helping Australia to retain the ashes. Richie Benno and his men played sporting cricket, and the policy paid off. Earlier at Wembley, Tottenham Hotspur won the cup and became the team of the century. Bobby Smith scored the first goal. <laughs> Leicester City had no answer to these Spurs. A good pass put Dyson in possession. Goal number two. 
Already league champions, Spurs had won the double for the first time in 63 years. And on that day, how good life was for Danny Blanchflower and his wonder team. Life was good too in the Commonwealth. The Sierra Leone, Britain's oldest colony in West Africa, became independent. Representing the Queen, the Duke of Kent conveyed the Independence Declaration to Premier Sir Milton Margai. The Queen herself toured India, Pakistan and Persia, seeing the infinite variety of the gorgeous East. The Maharaja of Benares was Her Majesty's host on this occasion. Eleven Commonwealth Premiers met at Lancaster House, and this time there was a note of regret. For South Africa was leaving the British family of nations. The new republic was proclaimed in Pretoria. Hopes were high in Washington when John Kennedy was inaugurated, the youngest man ever to be elected President of the United States. Millions believed that the West now had a man who would stand firm in face of the threat to humanity. If only all unofficial ambassadors were as friendly as Yuri Gagarin, first man to go into orbit. Britain certainly took him to its heart. In this field, America is rapidly catching up. First, the US rocketed a man into outer space 115 miles high. He was Commander Alan Shepard. He returned no worse for the experience. At the annual Red Square Parade, the Kremlin felt very much on top of the world, with Yuri Gagarin still very much the hero. No qualms over poisoning the atmosphere or rattling the saber in Berlin. But tragedy can come without war. It came to Croydon. The 33 boys killed in an air crash in Norway. The six other holidaymakers died at Chamonix when a jet plane cut the Mont Blanc cable railway. 81 people were trapped all night. Their rescue seemed a miracle to them. An avalanche in the Salzburg Alps killed three climbers. How puny men seem confronted with the wrath of nature. And how puny we often seem in trying to solve our own difficulties. Thousands of builders went on strike over a tea break. The year seemed to be a succession of strikes, most of them more serious than this. The teachers admittedly agitated with some good reason, demonstrating outside NUT headquarters. They maintained that they had a raw deal over the pay for. Fortunately, no strike. So all in all, we're grateful to the jokers who give us the unexpected laugh. Cyrus B. Tycoon Jr. built his own boat just to show he could do it. And thanks also to the rock and roll talent who got together at the Lyceum for the national championships. Going one better there was the twist. Life goes on. One birth pleased everyone. At Clarence House, Princess Margaret had a son. She had faith that the future is good. And if everyone has faith, it will be. The princess was a very happy mother when she and Lord Snowden left Clarence House to take the baby home. As for faith, there was plenty in evidence when 90,000 attended service at the Patrician Congress in Dublin, showing that mankind still cherishes values other than material. Life must go on, and high over Farnborough, airmen perhaps could see the world in right perspective. We must resolve that this pleasant land, indeed all lands, shall not be destroyed. Life is our right.